We've been getting a lot of questions lately about who we are, how we made it to where we are as, you know, three unemployed dudes who talk about investing on YouTube, who somehow turned 40K into more than $40 million. Today on Dumb Money, the story of how we sold a startup and started investing our own money full time, why we call ourselves Dumb Money, why we're even making these videos, and exactly what we did to get to this point. The good, the bad, the ugly, including a video that I made about Chris over 25 years ago about his hobby of shopping at garage sales that actually foreshadowed our current stock market investing style. Plus, we're going to reveal exactly what we're invested in right now as part of that $40 million portfolio. This is Dumb Money Live with Chris Camillo, Dave Hansen, and Jordan McLean. Streaming live on YouTube, we are Dumb Money. Hey there, Dave here along with Chris and Jordan. Welcome to Dumb Money Live this morning. It is an episode decades in the making. We're going to take you on a journey back from present day to our early years. Chris, how long have I known you? It's, we've We've been doing stuff since what? We're 14, 15 years old? Yeah, school library you know, skipping lunch, talking about <clears throat> how we we're going to place classified ads to start selling stuff in newspapers to make little amounts of money on, right, on trading things, right? Back then, that was at age 13, yeah. pretty much. Kind of <laughs> That's how it started. Well, here we are. Here we are doing it. And Jor classified Jordan, ads, doing. I met Jordan, what, was that like the early 2000s? Uh, let's see. I think the first time I ever met you was at like a Kaboom Town at Lens Car Dealership. I, yeah, that's probably right. Although I knew of yeah. you before that. I didn't. Oh, yeah. I'd heard your name like a million times. Because we were like competitors in the weird underground world of like programming for car dealers. Like I felt like we were uh, more like strange bedfellows. <laughs> well, that's strange <laughs> to say. <laughs> All right. Let's talk uh, first things first. Let's talk about this giveaway we're doing because on Monday we were talking about upcoming earnings like Peloton and just how much Chris made in that stock. So they, they have earnings coming up next week, a week from today. And Chris had the idea of we want to give back to you guys in the community who watch our videos, who are active in our Discord community. And so we, we made it official. We, we now are planning to actually do this. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think uh, I was up, yeah, as of yesterday, I was up $3 million in Peloton. Um, as of today, a little less. Um, but I think when we did this, made this decision, I was up 2.3 million, which is about 1,000 Peloton bikes, right? So if I made 1,000 Peloton bikes, <laughs> the least I could do is if Peloton hits earnings next week and goes up even a penny yeah. on earnings, all right? And by the way, they have a bigger chance of doing that today than they did yesterday. Now they're back down 10 bucks. No, exactly. This this uh, might be my buying pretty... opportunity for Peloton. I've been out of it. Yeah, 80 bucks? Do, do you realize that that while Chris, and, and this is this is crazy, while Chris has made 2 million plus in this stock, was it 2.3 2. when we did this thing? The promo yep. that we, yep. I'm going to show that promo in a second, by the way, because it's, it's pretty amazing. It also has our eagle in it. Um... <laughs> By the way, Dave, they're not entered in the promo just by being on our YouTube. They have to retweet Let me, the yeah. Dumb Money TV tweet, we'll, we'll right? We'll play it, and That's then we'll, we'll explain exactly what you need to do okay. to be qualified, because we want to make sure that everybody watching today is actually qualified for this thing and, and how we're going to actually choose the one. Hold on. Satoshi just, made, Satoshi just made a prediction. He said, with today's loss... Chris is actually just giving away a tricycle. <laughs> is that true? That, that's going to be our announcement at the end of the show. If, if things continue if to go as they are. Bankruptcy, if I file for bankruptcy between now and next Friday, I don't think I'm liable to have to give this Peloton away. <laughs> so we'll just have to wait. No, to if, if the stock goes up by one penny, you'll, you'll still be fine. And you're definitely giving this bike away. But guys, but guys, you got to, you know, Jordan and Dave, they said, well, we can't just give away a Peloton. You got to give away like a year subscription, too. So now I'm, well, now we got to give away a Peloton and a year subscription. Well, you but literally can't buy one without buying the first year subscription. So it's just kind of baked in. That's perfect. OK, and so it's actually yeah. an amazing. So but I just wanted to say that while Chris made all this money, I was only in Peloton like for a few days. Chris talked me into it and then I didn't like it anymore. And so um and we've talked about why and all this on the show, and we can go into that if you want. But uh, I made $10,000 on Peloton, and Chris made $2 million. So 
yesterday Megan was saying, I can't believe I just saw on social media how much you guys made on Peloton. Why won't you even buy me one? And I'm like, well, you don't realize I, I didn't make that much. That was that was all Chris. So here is here's the um, promo that we're running currently on Twitter and I think on Instagram. Take a look. We've made so much money on Peloton stock, $2.3 million in the last six months. I want to give away a Peloton bike to someone in our community. If Peloton stock trades higher after hours, we're going to give away a free Peloton. We will be live streaming Peloton's earnings call after the market closes on Thursday, September 10th. To have a shot, just share this post on Twitter and make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube. So be sure you watch us live on Thursday to see who wins. It could be you. That's awesome. I <laughs> love it. My favorite part of that, Dave, is Jordan on his Peloton. That I, when I saw that, I almost fell to the floor. It turned out so just, good. Him pedaling and then well, all the actually, stock so footage of other people on their Pelotons. You guys. Yeah. What's that? You you pedaling away and then all the stock footage people yeah. are pedaling. I thought that was great. <laughs> so anyway, amazing. to right. actually so what, what enter, have to do, you have to retweet our tweet that has that video. So we, we did it on Dumb Money TV. So at Dumb Money TV on Twitter and just retweet it. So I'll show you um, if I can pull up Twitter here. And Dave, you have software that will automatically random randomly pick someone. Is yes, that, how that is what we're doing. So we're basically going to look at for all of the retweets. And here actually is uh, my retweet of that video. Get in on this retweet. So basically, go to go to Twitter. Dumb Money TV is is our uh, Twitter handle, and retweet this. And how many retweets do we have so far? This is probably 17 Decent. retweets of me retweeting it, which is not how you enter. You need to actually go to I the original tweet. we have like a couple tweet. hundred retweets. We have 222 so it's like, it's like only a as of people. right now. Those are pretty good odds. So one in 223 how many right now. Oh, 227. Look at that. People are just like 227. getting in there. So here's the thing. They have to live in an area where I can order them a Peloton, though. Because like if you live in France, I can't order a Peloton there. Is so accurate. So it has to be in an area, right? Like the US, what is it? US, Canada, wherever Germany. Peloton ships to. And if, if someone yeah, who wherever. doesn't qualify wins, we'll, we'll pick another. But yeah, we're in, as yeah. long as we don't have more than I, I found some software that does it as long as we don't have more than 3000 retweets, which, you know, at this point, look at that 241. I don't, I don't see us getting to 3000. But I have I have a free way to do it. Otherwise, I think I have to buy some software. But we're gonna we're gonna do it based on retweets of this tweet. So make sure you get in on that. Yeah. Awesome. I, I, I love it. I love it. Um, all right. So before we get into talking about, you know, the full history and all that stuff, Dave, I, I can I want to just go over a very brief timeline of my account because people always ask us how long I get a bunch of people ask me how long did it take to make the first million? Yeah. Right. I got that tweet yesterday. So here's the thing. I invested $20,000 in the stock market in 2007, and it took me three years to grow that from 20,000 to three, no, wait, no, I invested $20,000 in the stock market in 2007, and it took me three years to grow that to $2 million. That's 100X in three years, okay? Now, over the next 10 years, I generated $15 million of additional returns off that money. And this year alone, so far, I've generated an additional $15 million of returns off that money. So that's $33 million over the last 14 years, starting with a $20,000 investment. That's that's it. Like that's my whole history right there. That's, that's amazing. I, I have not actually done that math to figure out what my, uh, timeline history was I, sh I should really do that but but you you did that because you were writing a book and you needed to get it audited and you have this you know in your book you published the yes. the trend line chart of what your portfolio did uh, as audited by some accounting firm um and, and then and jack jack schwager wrote the, is writing the the new market wizards book that i'm in and he did his own audit and he actually sent me his version of the audit so i can kind of look at everything i was looking through it last night and what was interesting is how much of that money I had to pull out for taxes over the years yeah. and you know, to buy a house and, you know, stuff like that. So, like, it's not like my account's sitting at 40, but but a lot of that had to be pulled out over the years. And I think, what if I didn't have to pull that money out? The compounded returns 
would have been exponentially higher now, right? I mean, I could be up to close to a hundred million right now. If, if without only, yeah. Those, and if only you didn't have so living expenses or you had, you know, some kind of income that was replenishing that money instead of having to take it out of the stock market. I, I saw, yeah, I saw you kid, tweeted yesterday, by the way, I saw your, uh, you tweeted that stock chart. The flex tweet. This is, my, my, this is I your new flex tweet. flex tweet. <laughs> yeah, that's my, that's my flex tweet. But here's the thing. People also want to know, like, where, where is this going? Well, listen, my plan is to take, my plan is to grow this to a hundred million dollars in the next five years and a billion dollars in the next 10 years. You might think that sounds crazy. No, I don't. I, but that's I, my plan yeah. and I'm sticking to it. I, I think that that, I think that you'll, you're going to do it for sure. I, um, by the I way, I sure. replied to your tweet. I don't know if you saw it yet, but, uh, here's, here's my stock it chart. Did. It's, it's not nearly as good as yours, but, uh, up 63% year to date. Uh, <laughs> and I should have taken that screenshot. I should have taken that screenshot a few days ago because I was even higher then, but there you go. That's, I did reply to it, Dave. And I was, I replied like, how good was the timing on my screenshot, right? Like <laughs> yes. that was that was it. The screen, the timing of me doing this last night was, in retrospect, genius. Um, it wouldn't look. It looked a little less impressive this morning, <laughs> to say the least. Um, now look, metal for breakfast. Yeah, that, uh, so, he he had one share of Microsoft, up seventy percent. Good job. Yeah, there you go. He edited Listen, some of I, the original I, Dumb Money Channel videos back in the day. I, I think the important thing, guys, is when we talk about our history here, people need to understand that it starts really small. Like we didn't start big. We started like really, really, really small. In fact, we, me and Dave, uh, and I know Jordan, you were working for many, many years, but we worked forever just to try to spin up a next, enough like side hustle money, right? To be able to even invest in the stock market, because like we had yeah. day jobs, we just worked normal day jobs, like everybody else does. For not not and just for a couple we, of years, we we worked real jobs yeah. for like a decade. Uh over a decade, yeah. Like we <laughs> worked our butts off for the man for over a decade, and the whole time we had little side things going on to try to scurry up a little bit of extra cash that we could invest in the stock market. And when we finally did, and we started investing. We had this social R methodology and it exploded. And I'll never forget the day that I crossed $100,000 in my brokerage account. I thought I was the richest person in the world. And that day, literally the thing that went through my head was someday I might be able to grow this to a million dollars. And I was like, and it wasn't that much longer after that. It was yeah. like a year and a half after that, that it, that it hit a million after I hit 100K. The first 100K um, was like a, a grind to get there. And then, oh. and then you had enough capital to actually, if you can, if you can double a thousand dollars, that is amazing, right? But if you can double a hundred thousand dollars, it's just it j just gives you that much more ammunition to keep doing that. Yeah, and when I wrote that book, Laughing at Wall Street, back, and that's the book that, guys, if you haven't gotten it yet, I still have a few hundred copies. Just dumbmoney.tv forward slash book. If you live in the U.S. I'll mail you a free book. My buddy Patrick's mailing out the books. He's doing it this week, next week. I want to get rid of these books. They're, they're free. We're just going to literally send it to you. But when I wrote that book, I turned 20K into 2 million. And I was wondering at the time, well, I, like, am I going to be one of those guys that just burns out, right? Like, that's just, like, I, I have the book. Like, I was so happy to have the book out because it was like cementing that I did something. And now maybe it was all going to fall apart. Like, I, I was like, can I ever take this twenty, this two, and turn it into twenty? Right, and like, I, it happened, right? Like, it, it literally is, it, it's happened, and now I'm at the same point, going, could I, could I turn to two hundred? Yeah, right. And we're gonna tell you some stories about you know things along the way, some of these random business ideas, and you see in our little timeline, uh, garage sales. That's a video that twenty five years ago uh, I made, following Chris around on this little thing that he would do is just going to garage sales, buying stuff, and then selling it for m more money than he paid for it. Which is, which sounds like something that Gary V is doing to this day. <laughs> we were so doing Gary V before Gary V even even knew what Gary V was. But okay. When did you <laughs> first realize that that kind of arbitrage of like buying stuff and then reselling it could? turn into something that you could use for the stock market? Was that, did you think about it in, in stocks first or as like a part of this garage sale thing and and not having any idea that you'd ever use it for stock market? I was obsessed with garage sales from even my preteen years because it was the one thing that if you're 11 or 12, you could actually go and when other people would go to look for toys, I would look for stuff that I was like, 
can I find something that someone else would pay me more money for? Right. Like that was my attitude. I don't know why that clicked in my head, but that was always my attitude. And the thing I realized was that all these garage sales are controlled by women, generally uh, older women that have deep expertise in antiques and certain types of collectibles. But they didn't have a clue or any respect for things that were male oriented. So even male watches, uh, railroad sets, um, all kinds of things that were male oriented, they didn't know how to price and they treated it like junk. So I would buy that type of stuff and I would then sell it to dealers that specialize in these various things. And this is pre eBay, of course. So if I had eBay, I would, it would have been so much easier. I didn't. So I had to find dealers around the country that I can mail things to to sell them. And I was arbitraging garage sale merchandise because I was it was it was social arb at the time because people just didn't understand what these things were worth because they had a bias, right? right? And what's so funny is now that when we developed social arb investing for the stock market, that bias totally opposite. The stock market was run by older male men, right? Men in New York and they had biases Right. They, you know, they know a lot about banks, maybe in sometimes energy, financials. They know very little about pop culture. They know very little about consumer behavior. They know very little about what's trending in the middle of the country. Right. Uh, about fashion, about things that are female oriented. So in the very beginnings of our trading, we leaned heavily towards female oriented and youth oriented trends, not because that was the only thing we could trade, because that was the easiest stuff. That was the stuff that had the largest social arb window. Like I remember we were investing in things that Wall Street wouldn't pick up on for months, literally months after they started trending. Yeah. And uh, Dave, do you remember, Jordan, the iPhone? I mean, just think back to the iPhone. That was like it seems like it's a million years ago, right? The iPhone came out and what happened, you know, that was actually one of my biggest trades was a big company like Apple because in New York, they were on AT&T and AT&T literally almost didn't work in Manhattan because of the way that their their data coverage worked like in yeah. with buildings. Dave, you knew yeah. that. You went to NYU. Did you know about that? No, it was terrible. The coverage was, was terrible on AT&T. You had to have Verizon if you were going to be in Manhattan. Yeah. And so because of that, like people weren't using iPhones on Wall Street and not to mention the fact that they were using Blackberries because they worked for these legacy financial firms that couldn't easily switch over to an iPhone. And all these dudes on Wall Street are using their Blackberry because that's what they got to use for free. And the whole world is ripping on the fact that the iPhone doesn't have a keyboard. Right. Yeah. And like Wall Street just didn't understand what was happening at my townhouse party in Dallas, Texas with a bunch of 22 year olds. Everyone right, showing off this were, new this new device they have that is revolutionary. It changed everything about about the way they communicated. And it didn't even have an app store at the time. And it was it was so game changing. Yeah, I mean, it, and it changed the way not j just the way you interact with your phone. People were able to play games with the accelerometer that they've never been able to do before. And that was that was pretty early on. Pretty awesome. Yeah. But Jordan, no one was seeing that in the financial yeah. industry. Totally. They, they physically weren't in a place to be able to see it. They had what we call geographic bias. OK, there's demographic bias and there's geographic bias. This is one of those trades where there was a massive amount of geographic bias. Um, and. Honestly, people are like, oh, I bet that methodology only works on penny stocks or small stocks. No, the biggest. No, the it biggest works on the, the biggest. biggest stock in the world. Yeah. And by the way, not just the biggest, but the most covered stock in the world. And that's why, if you get this book for free, um, that I'll send you, I had a whole chapter just on Apple and about all the analysts at the time and all the big, the most, you know, the most prominent media journalist in the world that said that this thing could never, ever, ever, ever work. A phone without a keyboard was just for an imbecile idea, right? Yeah. <laughs> Jordan, do you remember what your first ever investment was? Yeah, Apple. Was it? Was it really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. No way. 100%. Huh. That's awesome. That's awesome. Why? Like, tell, like, did you open a brokerage account to, to invest in Apple? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, this was um, this was before their first split, I think, or they had that big seven to one split, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I remember investing in them. I think it was like in the E. Carlos days. We were about a year in, and I um, I heard. I think it was because of you, Chris. I think you started talking about Apple and all these things, and I was like, you know what? I need to get on this. So I opened a TD Ameritrade account, and I bought my first. You know, you know I don't even remember how many shares. That? I remember you coming and talking to me at E. Carlos because yeah. we knew each other. We were getting to know each other pretty well. 
And you were talking to me about wanting to invest. And I was like, oh, this is so cool, right? Like I love like I love that. I love more than anything when someone that had in- investing was totally off the radar. Cause let's the thing is, Jordan, you were an entrepreneur. Like you were an entrepreneur engineer, right? Like, so your mind thought that way. But the one thing that you were missing was a just simply simple exposure, exposure to this world, right? I always like your exposure to it more than anything else. And I think a lot of the reason why we do this show at Dumb Money is we want to give the entire world exposure to people like us that have had tremendous success. Because unless you're exposed to this, unless you actually see this and feel it, you don't believe that it's possible, right? And so the more people we can get in front of with this show, and that's a big part of our motivation, right? Everyone asks, what's your motivation? Do you want to sell stuff to people? Do you want to come up with a trading program? Like, are you trying to, like, what are you trying to do? What's your game here? What's, what's your purpose? I'm like, our purpose is legit to save the world, to save humanity, because I believe that, you know, 80 to 90 percent of people in life are stuck working for the man. Right. And they believe that their only road in life is to work for wealth. Well, if we can convince people that you don't have to just work for wealth, that you're you can let your money work for you. Kind of like that book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You don't have to you don't have to do it all yourself. Your money will work for you. Right. And I think and like unless you're. Yeah. I agree with that, Chris, but the th- at the same time, you are the hardest working person I know, and that's why you've done so well, because you combine hard work with your money to then go make money, right? This doesn't just happen by accident. And that's what I say. Chris, so Chris is the hardest working, and his, his brain is always on. He's always thinking about yeah. like what the next trend is, what the next investment is, and this is going back to you know when, I, when you were 15 years old, and we would sit around trying to brainstorm crazy little schemes of how we could make more money or wh- whatever it is. That I mean, that just goes way back in your history, like. But you know what, guys? It's not mutually exclusive, and you don't have to make tens of millions of dollars. Most people aren't necessarily needing or wanting to have to make tens of millions of dollars. If they can make one million dollars over twenty years, ten, ten or twenty years, that is a huge game changer for their life. And I truly believe that time beats effort, meaning just having your money in the market and having it sit there for a long amount of time, that is the most important thing. Now, if you can start to optimize it the way we do with social arb investing, getting social edge and picking the right stocks, well, you can accelerate that, right? And that's always kind of- I don't think it's even making a million dollars. It's saying, you know what? I'm not gonna- I'm not going to go buy that new car this year. You know what? I'm going to put that money and I'm going to sock it away. I'm going to invest it. And then when my daughter gets married or when I retire, I'll have some extra traveling money or whatever it happens to be. Right. And so it's it's about changing your mindset about money and realizing that, you know, the investments are probably a better place to put your money than than a lot of other places. And for me, it's always been about like working smarter and not harder. Like I, the whole grind mentality, the, the Gary V way of living is not for me. I love to simplify things, find the way to put in the least amount of effort and have the maximum reward from it, right? And and to me, yes, I did for 10 years go and work a job that I, you know, worked my, climbed my way up that corporate ladder at Yahoo back when it was a real company that uh, was bigger than Google at the time. Uh, but that wasn't for me. I mean, I did it for 10 years and I learned more than anything that was that that was better than business school but i for me it was it was more just the exposure to a way of thinking that i don't want to do this let me find something that i can do on my own that that i can benefit from the time and effort and then try to find ways now i do as little as possible right i mean i spent i've spent more time making youtube videos than i do thinking about the stock market <laughs> and it's so much more fun <laughs> and you know what that that touches it touches on another topic for me the most important thing is having risk capital. And what I mean by that is, I think the biggest obstacle for most people, the number one hurdle to making that leap to having a bucket of money that's really growing rapidly like ours is, that they're not having to physically work for, is just initiating a bucket of capital in their life that is designed to put into high risk, right? And high risk could be something as simple as stocks, right? Yeah. Growth stocks. On days like today, you're not worried. You don't even blink an eye that you lost 10% of your money because that money's supposed to lose 10% every once in a while. But over the long run, it's going to 
make you rich. I call it other in my book. I call it other people's money because I don't think I think there's a mental block. You can't just take money that's designed for a vacation or designed for a college education or designed even just to pay your rent or to pay your mortgage. No, you can't take that money and put it at risk. You have to completely segment your life into this is my risk account and then this is my living account. And it took us a long time, decades to get to the point where we had enough in our risk account where we could actually live off of that risk account. So, but how do people actually do that? And and the, the way that I came up with was what if you change your lifestyle and think about every dollar as being worth a hundred dollars? Because in my book, I turned 20K into 2 million, which is a hundred times your money in three years by taking big risk on big investments, right? And so if you think of it that way, if you start coup- clipping coupons, I don't clip coupons right now, but I used to in the back in the day. So if you might not ordinarily be interested in clipping a coupon to save a dollar. Like my time is worth more than a dollar and it's kind of embarrassing, right? But what if that dollar is a hundred dollars? Cause you can grow it to a hundred dollars over three years or even over five or six or 10 years, right? All of a sudden, now you're motivated to clip that coupon to save a dollar. Now, here's the important thing. You're only clipping the coupon to save a dollar because you're going to take that dollar and put it in this side bucket, right, that's designed to do really risky things, okay? And when you do those risky things, you're not worried about it because that was never your money to begin with. That's money that you got because you were willing to risk it to make the $100 off the $1. Like mowing your lawn is what, 30 bucks a week, 40 bucks a week? You can save 150 bucks a month maybe mowing your lawn, but you're like, I don't want to save. I would rather pay 150 a month. But would you pay $15,000 a month to mow your lawn? Because that's how much that money could grow into in just a few years, taking big risk on social RBEX like we do, right? And so if you could change your mentality to think like that, all of a sudden, you're finding money all over your life, right? And, and to, to save, to bargain, to like, let's delay. I always say, like, let's delay that purchase a year. If I delay a purchase one year, how much cheaper is that TV going to be in a year? That exact TV, right? That, it, right? You'll save a 300 bucks. That's like 30,000 bucks, right? If you multiply by 100. Yeah. Hey, Chris, you saw that uh, you saw that spreadsheet that I put together of like, by how often you trade your car in, how much yes. money you'll you'll waste on cars. And it's like, if every, you know, if you trade your car in every year and it's like, starts out being a $55,000 car, over 30 something years, you'll spend about a million dollars on cars. Seriously. And that, which is crazy. You know, you didn't, if you can delay that to the six to eight year mark, you uh, spend about a fifth of that. And but Jordan, you think, you, think about, that was amazing, but you know what you didn't do? You need to add the time value of that money to and I how much it will grow. Do you have yeah. any idea how much bigger that would be if you mm-hmm. actually like added in conservative you can return? even say like if you, even if you just invest that five percent how much how much will that grow yeah. right you just throw it in like the spy exactly but that's something that we've kind of done all along i remember like i would drive the same car for for way longer than most people right i how long did i have that like uh that mitsubishi eclipse how long did i have the, like like i would i would have these cars and just keep them now i just lease and you know don't worry about it but Back in the day, I was very conscious of if I were to trade my car in, I'm going to just take this big hit. And Chris, how long you you drive your car until they that Jeep you had? It was like falling apart. The bumper was falling off. I drove the junkiest cars, guys. I had at one point I had a Jeep that was so junky, a CJ, that it literally the transmission fell out of it. And my parents said, "Son, you know you can't. You just got to get a real car." And 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 they. They said, Let, we'll help you get a car that will just be reliable so you can finish college. Because like I was in, I was at SMU and I, I lived like, you need a way to get to school reliably. And so my parents helped me buy a Dodge Neon, but not a normal Neon. It was a special based out Neon. They only make like a few of these a year that have literally have zero options. When I say they have zero options, mine had like a mat this inch thick in the for the back seat it was like a piece of foam that stretched across this like a, a board in the back seat. That car cost I think eight thousand or seventy seven hundred dollars brand new, like eight grand, brand new, brand new car for like eight grand. I sold that car three years later or two or three years later for I think it was two years later ready for this for a profit I because the the the, 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 the when you look at the black book for the value of a neon when you go to trade it in it said it it averages based on average 
amount of options, right? They don't have a trade-in value for that weird based out car. So it's just like they're just giving you wholesale based on what it should be worth, a normal neon, not the weird one that literally doesn't even have air conditioning inside of it, right? And you, yeah, you were um, so proud of that at the time. And, but you oh, were not proud of driving that car. Like I made a video about you back in the day where I uh, pointed out how you scraped the name off so that people wouldn't know that it was a, a neon. A neon, like that would help. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. That is, that's insane. Um, but yeah, guys, it's, it's all about, it, it, it really is all about having risk tolerance. I keep my cars for six to eight years. So even today I will keep my car for about seven years. I remember the, the, the scariest moment in my life financially, not scary, like the moment that I thought this is going to cost me a million dollars over my lifetime was I, I bought my wife her wedding ring back in 2004 it was the most expensive thing i've ever bought in my life i was like i can't believe it was it literally took like all my money back then to buy this like th this wedding ring and i knew when i bought that wedding ring that the investment returns that i was giving up on the money that i spent that ring on i could literally probably retire off of right at some point in life and that's exactly what happened like when i i still compute in my head the returns I would have gotten off that ring. But, you know, it was so special to her. It meant something to her, and I'm so happy I did it. But, it, like, you know, that's how I think. I'm like, I'm so frugal because I think about a dollar not as a dollar. I truly think about every dollar being a hundred or even a thousand dollars, right? If invested right. So, like, I'm thinking a thousand to one now because that 20K is now well over 20 million, right? So, and now it's just in 14 years. So like when you think of every dollar as being a thousand dollars, think about how frugal you get. And that's oh, yeah. why I'm so frugal. That's why people think I'm insane when I'm like, you know, I'm having an above ground pool in my backyard, right? <laughs> in, in the most expensive neighborhood in the state, it, which is insane, no, right? Like that was that like, was because you I'm needed insane. it quickly and you're but you are you're you're going to do an in ground pool next yeah, season, but your your budget on that is like a quarter of the average budget for an in-ground pool in this neighborhood. If and not our less. friends are making fun of me. They're like, why do you have such a strict budget when you've made all this money? I'm like, I'm like, I think it's all right. about setting expectations with contractors too, though, right? Because if they, yes. they come in, they see the neighborhood and they're like, oh, yeah. oh there's definitely there's definitely a surcharge here. Totally. Now, totally. I think it's time. We have all these people on. They came no, no, for I one reason. No, no, I have a question for you, Dave. I have to, I have to ask you a question. Okay. I have to, I, there's something on my mind. If we're going back, can I just ask you? Well, we're going to go. We're going to go just... all the way back and show that garage sale video after we reveal our portfolio. So, how far? How, Fine, how far I'm back gonna... are you going? Even further back. I want you to tell us because I just remember this last night. Tell us about your little on and off again career as a jingle man, right? Tell, tell us about that. <laughs> do you have that still? Do you have? Can you pull? The, uh, I wish I would have told you in advance. Yeah, you should have told me. Out. No, yeah, I, I, I was in radio. I, I'm not, I'm not a jingle man, but I did actually work at a production <laughs> studio where they sang all the jingles. Like, there's one studio in Dallas where all of those radio jingles were recorded, and I worked there, but not for the jingle company. I worked there for uh, a show. This was like my senior year in high school, right before I went to college. It was called USA Overnight, and from midnight until 6 a.m., I would go to this recording studio in the middle of the night, and I was the producer of this live syndicated show that was on in a bunch of different markets. Uh, do you remember the DJ Shadow Stevens? His kid brother was the DJ who uh, hosted this show, and I would go there, and I would put together all the sound bites, the entertainment stuff. I'd do these edited, like, movie reviews. I had my own little movie review thing on the side before the internet really existed. I, I was doing uh, this thing called the blurb where I would do these two minute radio interview like things on where I would give movie reviews to morning shows across the country by calling into the morning show and doing a little back and forth with the DJ. So I like I was, I was doing I did so much random stuff. But how about the CD that you made that you used to sell? You had a CD of like sounds that yes. you sold to other radio stations. What was that? So that was called Radioactive Noise. I, I think the website is still up. And that was <laughs> that was production elements that were like this new cutting edge style that like that really is they're still using to this day. I hear my sound effects on radio to this day, by the way. And it was <laughs> it was this thing that I sold for like fifteen hundred dollars for a single CD that had like a thousand little random noises like like record scratches and like digital noise and just all kinds of radioactive noise 
and I had uh, a one called Drum Beats, and I had I, I came up with this whole like series of things. But yeah, I, I produced uh, I produced some of the sounds that are still being used to this day on broadcast uh, radio and television. MTV was a client. It's awesome. I love it. But yeah, I that was that was my it. that was my um, pre college career was doing all kinds of radio stuff, and I would come back to Dallas during the summers, and I was a DJ. Uh, on pretty much, I, I think in Dallas, I've been on every station. I was on, I, I started at Y95, which turned into Oldies 94.9, which turned into Power 95, and there was a bunch of different things. I was at 106.1 KISS FM when they first signed on. I did all the production. That was that was when I was in high school, too, because the radio station was just a few blocks from the high school. And after school, I would go and produce the stuff for, like, the morning show and all of the promos and stuff like that. And then I would come back, and in the summer, I was, um, I was on... On 94.5 The Edge and uh, also uh, Mix 1029. I did nights at Mix 1029, like just, you know, for the fun of it until they went to. Like, I would go automated. to your over to your house, your 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 parents house and your whole bedroom, literally it, the entire wall from floor to ceiling, the whole wall was nothing but like processors for editing equipment, yeah. like like the like the, the processing power just to be able, was that like the old Avid systems basically you were using no, back in the day? No, before that. It was like a Commodore 64 that was running the video toaster. That was my video <laughs> platform. And then I had this cassette-based <laughs> multi-track recording where I produced things in my parents' house for radio stations across the country. It was- And before, and, and I, I really and, and, wanna ask this too, because- <laughs> oh, Remember that closet? Once, once I was in college and my parents moved from that house, I took over the back house where we both, by the way, you'll, you'll see in this garage sale video, we we lived in our parents' garage, like above the garage house. And I turned the closet in there into a full on recording booth where I had the foam stuff all over the walls. And I had a feed going out to my mixing console that was, yeah. you know, at the foot of my bed with this whole big wraparound studio. It was it was a very like I loved doing that stuff. And I that's why I, I, I'm on YouTube now, because like I couldn't actually make a career of that. It was just fun for me. And now I get to like make this kind of stuff on. You get to do it YouTube. fun for all of us, which is awesome. And, and Jordan, you're just you've always been I, I never really asked you, Jordan, like I've known you so many years, like prior to us, like our time, like you've always been like a build. Like I just think of you as a, like a builder. You've got to be building stuff at all. Like. Before e Carlos, like before you started working to build the tech behind e Carlos, like what did you build anything as a kid, like engineer, like with your engineer mind, like what was your like entrepreneur? How did your entrepreneurial spirit like flow out back then, or did you just, or did it come later? Yeah, I think it came later. Um, I got really into en engineering um, in college. Uh, before that, I literally had no idea what I was going to do. Um, <laughs> Like Do I, you ever have any but, idea in college that you would uh, very shortly thereafter found a software company, uh, be the co-founder of this thing that that had a huge windfall, and now you're just like uh, retired and investing your money? No, no idea, no idea. <laughs> no, I mean, I thought I would go be an engineer at some random, you know, Fortune 500 company for the rest of my life. And was that uh, your like you know, five or ten year plan? Uh, yeah, like fifty year plan. Fifty yeah. year plan. Yeah. <laughs> Is yeah, it, but, uh, you know, but what's so important about that story, guys, so you just heard what Jordan's 50-year plan was. It is so critical, and everyone talks about this, who you surround yourself with, because simply by having exposure to our other friend, Lynn, uh, who Jordan was initially partnered with on eCarList, and later on us, and kind of just having exposure to our way of thinking, took his powerful builder mindset and, and brain power and just redirected it a little on a slightly different path. Um, and I think that was a game changer for his life. But honestly, it was a game changer for our life, too, because there's no way that we would have achieved what we would achieve without having him as part of our team. Right. And Absolutely. like, so you really have to consciously think about who you want to surround yourself with. I don't care what point of life you're in. If you're 40 or 50 or 60 or 70, you're trying to do something interesting. You got to be around people that have, you know, different mindsets that are going to expose you to different elements of the business community, to, of investing, of being 
you know, entrepreneurial, like you just have to force yourself into different social circles, period. I think that's the most important. That's like the biggest life lesson I'm going to give to my kids. Yes, like not even just social circles. I mean, I, I think social circles are important, but also just different, you know, if I were to just totally appease myself and dive into things, I would just be, you know, studying science all day, every day. But I know that I need to learn different um, different things to be successful in my life. So I, you know, I try to be well rounded. I try to learn about politics. I try to learn about, you know, uh, monetary policy and economics and monetary monetary policy and all these different uh, um, all these different things. And it comes full circle, right? Like it ultimately yeah. contributes to your investing mindset, which is important because we don't look at a lot of the stuff you look at, but we have access to it through your brain power, right? And so like, mm -hmm. you can't do what we're doing alone, guys. It just, it doesn't work. It literally does not work. And you know what? If you don't have someone, you can be part of our team through the Discord community. Dumb, what is it? Dumbmoney.tv forward slash Discord. That's I it. tell everyone that. Everyone's like, Chris, can you coach me? Could you do this? I'm like, no, just join our Discord. There's like 500 of me and Dave's and Jordan's inside of there. And we're a team together. And like, like you don't get it. It's not, that's not how it works. Like it's, it's group. It's about shared knowledge and shared experience and shared insight and shared vetting. And like, that's what this is all about. By the way, when we talk about motivation, guys, if you want to know why we do this, why we're on YouTube spending all this money to put together this show to share with you guys, part of it is selfish. Part of it is because we need you. We need the best of the people that are following us to join us in Discord to help us surface new investments, to actually help us vet investments. Some of my biggest trades this year, guys, are the result of me building confidence from reading about research that's being done in our Discord group from people that follow this show. Like I am, I have more to benefit from our audience than they have to benefit from me. Yeah. And that's what people don't realize. I so think like, that you, oh, you I even talked about selling us something at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. No, no, I'm making more money off you from your brain than from your dollars, right? Like, I don't want your money. I want access to your insight. I want access to what you see in Ohio, in Atlanta, in California. I want you to help me vet investments. I want you to help me make more money for me, but I don't want your money. Like people don't understand that. And it's a big part of why we do this channel. Sorry, that was my rant for the day. Good rant. No, I, I, I want to see what we want to do. We need to do a portfolio reveal because people have been tuning in and dying to see it. And we also need to show this garage. Should we like flip the order? Should we go ahead and since we're talking about all of like our history, should we show this video yeah. and then reveal our portfolios right after? Yeah, I think we have to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. So let's, uh, this, this video was 25 years ago, the summer, 26 years ago, the summer of uh, 94, I think. I, I can't remember, but I, I, I looked it up at the time. It was, tw it was 26 years ago and we're like 19 years old. And this was in the summer, uh, Chris was living in his parents, like I said, in the in the back house above his parents' garage. So embarrassing. And this is like something we, ju we just shot in one day and it's, it's, it's like me trying to be a documentary film guy. So <laughs> here it is, it's a YouTube debut. This is Garage Sale Underworld. The Garage Sale. On any given weekend, you're sure to find 10 of them. Furniture, jewelry, appliances, just about anything can be found at garage sales. But there's more to it than the merchandise. The people who actually go to these sales make up the garage sale underworld. Most of the serious shoppers are antique dealers looking for a great deal on a one-of-a-kind item. But there are the eccentrics. Like Buddy, who likes to buy what he describes as junk. If you can't buy the best, buy the worst. And there's Chris, a 19-year-old college student majoring in business. Amongst the garage sale underworld, he's known to be the best at what he does, buying old junk and reselling it to antique dealers and consignment stores for profit. We like to go out and make some money. It's 4 a.m., and Chris is making it's out there by 5.30 anyway. In the middle of the night. It's now 5.30 a.m. Chris has chosen the Mimosa sale at 6635 Mimosa as his first sale of the morning. Is that it? We got it. There's nobody here yet. All right, we did it. First step one. Chris is somewhat conservative as far as professional garage sale shoppers go. He prefers to wait until seven or eight before knocking on the door and waking the homeowner up. They're up. They don't want us to know they're up. I guarantee should we, you they're should up. Should we knock on the door? Shh, 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 shh. Keep it quiet though. I don't want to, I don't want them to get mad at us. I might, uh, I want to stay in their good side. If they can let us in before anybody else, you know, we don't want to disturb them. Just after daybreak, one of Chris's chief competitors arrives at the sale. 
guys having a garage sale today? Everyone in this underground society seems to know each other, and yet they are all willing to all but kill each other to get to the very profitable jewelry first. Chris was able to keep his competition away by convincing them that it would be hours before the sale opened. But, you know, if they're not up, then... You know, they're not, we haven't even seen a speck of light come out of the house yet. Just before 7 a.m., lights were seen in the house, and shortly after, the homeowner emerged, presumably to hang garage sale signs. He let Chris get a coveted peek at the merchandise and informed him that the sale wouldn't start until 9. What did you see? Can, did you have that on camera? Yeah. Did you get that on camera? With our help, Chris determined he'd do better at another sale. After closely reviewing the tape, uh, we got a good peep inside the sale. Uh, nothing worth staying for. It's still early enough to get to another sale before it opens. Chris was lucky. Okay, where, where are we going? No, no. Right. Oh, it's a disappointment. Definitely a disappointment for the first sale today. But hey, we got a we got a peep early. At least we wouldn't stick around until nine to find that out. Fifty-eight eighteen Ferndale. This could be a good. One. I like the house and I like the cars. I like the furniture I see inside. It's a furniture sale. We could get a good piece of furniture out of this one. Could also get some good electronics. Nice. Moments later, the competition finds him. Chris tries to scare them away by spreading a rumor that the sale wouldn't open until 9. It didn't work. An even larger crowd gathers. After only five minutes on the scene, a team of antique dealers decides to ring the doorbell. They got no answer. Good morning. Good morning. However, a few minutes later, the owner of the house appeared and informed the crowd that they would be opening. The shoppers flocked to the house and crawled under the slowly opening garage doors. Okay. The jewelry was hit first. Buddy found his kind of items. You know, if you can't buy the best, buy the worst. <laughs> The homeowner was happy. But I love him, because I got to get rid of this stuff. <laughs> Did you say something about another sofa that was coming? After only a few minutes, the professional shoppers had come, bought, and left, on their way to the next sale. Everything, including the family pet, was picked over. Chris found a sofa, and even I found something. It'll look great in my office, and for just five bucks, how could I pass it up? Chris moved on to his next sale, to fight with the garage sale vultures, and I'm going to get some sleep. I'm Dave Hansen for Metro Media News. <laughs> oh my gosh. That the hair, was amazing. dude, the hair. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> dude, Dave, it, it was a newspaper and a map. What, what was that book with the maps were in? It was called Mapsco. Map that was before MapQuest yeah. existed. That was like a paper book that had every street you had to go to like 35B was like the page number and the coordinates. <laughs> the best did you know that guy with the beard and the cigarette? Like, did you know that guy? No, we, I, I mean, Chris may have from, uh, this is my yeah, first and only all, time garage, dude, sh garage sailing. I knew all of them. And the best part is Patrick, who is there with me on that, in the car and in the house with me. Like he's the guy that's mailing out my books right now. Like, like for and his, it's really cool because his daughter is getting to doing it with him, and she's gonna invest all the money. So, like, just so you guys know how cool this is. Like, my buddy's daughter is mailing out books with him, and the money is all going towards her uh, investment account. She's learning how to invest, like, that's which so is cool. so cool. Yeah. Uh, but God, <laughs> the hair, dude. What was I thinking? <laughs> Did anybody even talk to me about that back then? Like. I mean, no, that was kind of the thing, right? That was, that was yeah. Was I had the same style. bit. I had the full. I had the full part down the middle. Yours went to here, which is pretty crazy. Mine went to like here. Mine went even further. I was, Did it? Uh, oh my gosh! Oh yeah. I, I, it was. <laughs> so it was just bad, long. And, oh, yeah. So All right. Bad. That was amazing. All right. Thank you uh, for for uh, letting us entertain you with that uh, piece of our history. And we, we, we are going to take questions. We're going we're gonna to go to the live chat in the Ask Us Anything, but we do need to do this uh, portfolio reveal because um, the stock market is just falling apart. I'm, I'm going to reveal not only how much, I, what, you know, what I'm in, but also how much I've lost. And it's, it's worse than it was <laughs> this morning, like since we've been uh, on the air. So Dave, I'm hedged. So I'm I am up 39,000 from where I was when we started the show, which means my hedge is working. Um, but 
I'm still down 1.76 million. Okay. I'm I'm down <laughs> 523,000 at this point. Whoa, sorry, dude. I'm sorry. I, I sorry. It hurts, man. It hurts. But we'll get you know. We got we got another couple decades to get this money back. We'll get it back. So let's let's start with your hedge. <laughs> what 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 is your hedge this morning? So yeah, let me talk about my hedge. That's really interesting. My hedge will kind of give away some of my biggest positions. Um, I, I I as you guys probably know, my biggest positions are Amazon, which is you know a four million dollar position, a three million dollar position in Peloton, uh, you know a million dollar position in Vista Outdoors, about a million in Apple, almost a million in Tesla. Uh, about 800k in GAN and 700k in Generac, about 700k in Shopify, 700k in DocuSign, and then about half a million in Livongo and half a million in Salesforce and half a million in Roku, about half a million in Apple, and then I have like Home Depot at 400k, Lulu at 380k, Twilio at 370k. Um, so that those are my big positions. I also have stuff like Square and you know st I have some bounce back stocks like Expedia. I do have a little bit of Facebook, a little bit of Wayfair. Uh, a little bit of Rocket. I still have some of my outdoor stocks, guys, like Do, um, a little bit of Netflix. Uh, and then I have my crazy, uh, eight, oh, Activision, of course, I have some Activision. But these are like 200K positions, right? Two, two to 250. Uh, a little Logitech, a little ECL, a little Ruger, a little Crocs, a little Azek, that company that makes, um, you know, the, the, the wood, the fake wood flooring. Uh, a little bit of Zoom. My Zoom's, you know, they're not doing so good the last couple of days, but a little bit of Zoom. Um, I also have some Peloton options that I sold out of this morning, but I still kept 100 contracts for September 18th. Um, a little bit of Penn and Lowe's and Vital Farms we've talked about in the show before. Uh, Shopify, of course, uh, a little bit. Um, SE, which is that Korean Amazon company that I found out about through our Discord group. And, you know, you know, I got that Royal Caribbean. Cruise is going to cruise eventually, right? So I got a little Royal Caribbean. That, by the way, is the only uh, thing that was my... in the green in my portfolio at all today. Yeah. Oh, Zoomies, a little plug, a little Disney, my forever stock, Disney, a little DEO, KBH, TDOC, PII, uh, STZ, the alcohol company, a little gap. You know about my gap trade on the on the Yeezy, on the Yeezy, uh, Kanye, Kanye endorsement, a little workhorse, a little bit of Win Casino for when we get out, we're out of this mess, right? And Jout and a little bit of Sabre when we're out of this mess, uh, DHI, BLDP, FVAC. Uh, beacon roofing. We talked about that trade. It's not a big trade for me, but I have a little beacon. I know Jordan. I still have some of that DIIBF, that bicycle company out of Canada that makes Schwinn and stuff. So Darrell Industries. Darrell Industries. Yeah, I, I bought more of them actually a, a little while ago. And you know, I got my Nikola because I'm just waiting for that next collab to be announced. But I hate Nikola, but I own Nikola. <laughs> I hate it, but I own it. I own it temporarily, but I hate it. You hate it as a and company. You love it as a stock. Yeah. And guys. By the way, I'll talk about my hedge, but I, I, I'm shorting Ruth. I'm shorting Dave and Buster's. I'm shorting VF Corp because I think fans are going to have a really tough quarter. But I might rethink that if people do a lot of outdoorsy stuff this winter and it, if it ends up being good for uh, North Face. But I'm looking at the data really hard. But I want to talk about the hedges I put on this morning. So I put on a hedge uh, on the QQQ. And what I did was I bought 400 of the 295 puts expiring tomorrow. Um, and that, you know, right now the market value of those puts is about $375,000. I also bought um, Amazon puts. I have 30 of them. My Amazon puts are the uh, 3425 puts expir expiring tomorrow. And it's about $300,000 of puts on Amazon that I have. Okay. And that's, I bought that's, puts a, on that's my a hedge because you own so much Amazon. That's a hedge. It's a hedge, okay? Because uh, I own so my own four million dollars of Amazon. I bought a hedge on my Apple. Uh, Two hundred of the one thirty puts expiring tomorrow. It's about one hundred and sixty k worth of puts right now. And I bought a hedge on my Tesla. So about 50, 50 contracts of the four hundred and thirty strike price put expiring tomorrow. It's about a hundred thousand dollar, hundred twenty thousand dollar hedge put right there. So I have, you know, I don't know what that is, guys. About six or seven or eight hundred thousand dollars maybe close to a million dollars of option puts that just to carry me through to tomorrow. Um, I'm going to look at this really closely when I get off of the show today and monitor the market. If I start, and this is, I'm not great at this. I want to be very clear with everyone. As good as I think I am uh, as a social arb investor, 
uh, basically early identifying change and connecting that change and investing in companies that would benefit or be harmed. I don't time markets. It's just not what I do, guys. Like I'm not any better than anybody else in the world at timing markets. And I don't want to pretend to be any better. Um, I'm going to do the best I can to hedge myself a little bit here. The only market I ever really timed was the great pandemic of 2020 uh, when we saw it coming. But that's because we had actual information, right? So we basically hedged the entire market and went deep short just prior to the big market collapse 2020, yep. which is a big part of my gains this year. Um, but I did a little bit of that in 2008, but I was about a day late. And so I saved myself from losing money in 2008, um, but I didn't make any money back then uh, off of that big market collapse. Uh, but that's it. That's my portfolio, guys. And that's how I'm hedging it. So, you know, and I have not done any hedging yet. And it's probably I hope it's not too late. I, I don't know what's going on. I mean, it's it's just when you have the market doing this, uh, we're, we're seeing levels we haven't seen since seven days ago. I mean, that's how dramatic <laughs> this is. But yeah. Anyway, here, here's here's my portfolio, um, and and the app is sorting it alphabetically instead of by uh, by holdings. But I can tell you that Amazon is is my biggest holding. Then uh, we have Apple, DocuSign, GAN, uh, Match.com, Microsoft, Netflix, Restoration Hardware, Roku, Tesla, and Wayfair. And that's it. I have such a simple portfolio compared to what Chris is in. I also do have options in, uh, oh, look, Cheesecake Factory. Those those options that expire in uh, January uh, are up $700 Calls? today. Calls, yes. Okay. Calls? Yes. Okay. Uh, and then I have our Cruiser's Gonna Cruise that I just have to have for uh, for the sake of uh, my T-shirt. Uh, those are the Royal Caribbean January uh, 60 calls that are up $12,000 today. That's my okay. only... That's my only ray of hope is that uh, cruisers are going to cruise. Nice. I don't know why I had nice. that chart on the like whole that. time. Sorry about that. And Jordan, I know you don't make any, like, your account's not crazy or anything, but can you just tell us a couple stocks that kind of uh, would represent the type of stuff that's in your portfolio? You know, you don't have to tell us, like, exactly how much. Yeah, my, my, I mean, my biggest position is also Amazon. I mean, it's no. not half my portfolio, but it's like 5 or 6% at this point. Um, which is um, which is about as high as I'll let something get. Is, it, is that um, but the I biggest don't... percentage? Oh yeah, you're, you're well yeah, diversified. By double. Yeah, yeah, by double. So then after that, it's um, Google and Facebook and Microsoft are the next three biggest, um, and then just a bunch of random stuff. Um, like I'm still holding on to Polaris. I'm still holding on to HP's probably actually <laughs> embarrassingly. A good size um, position. Now, my worst, I will tell you, my worst trade so far this year, energy transfer. And I'm still holding on to it for some reason. I don't know. I just can't, I can't. Can't pull the trigger on that one. Yeah. It was a bad, it was a bad play. Uh, but I've got AES. I've got, um, what else do I have? Um, oh, I've got a REIT. I've got, um, what is that thing called? Annalee Capital Management, NLY. Um, mm -hmm. That's a good size one and a good, uh, good little payout. I think like, 10% or something like that a year. Um, but yeah. If we look at my, like yeah. my biggest holding is Amazon. Chris, I don't know what your like percentage of your account is in a single uh, stock these days, but Amazon is 43% of my portfolio. So you can tell what 5% um, loss in Amazon is doing to me today. That's huge, Dave. That is like crazy. That's, that's like crazy your, the way you used to invest back back in the day when you would put like 80% of your portfolio into a single yeah, stock. I, do you know at one point in my life, I had 100%, and by the way, the guys, we're gonna have a lot of episodes like this where we'll dig into different aspects of our past. We can't get our whole history in one episode, but uh, I had 100% of my portfolio in the Nintendo stock back when the, I think, was it the Switch? Not the, when the Switch first came out, or the one, not the not the Switch, way before that. What was no, the no, big Nintendo the, platform 15 years ago? Yeah, the, the, like, what was the big, that? Just, just oh, the, 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 the Wii, Wii. The Wii. The when Wii. the Wii, yeah. the, before it came out, when, when at the E3 conference, and my yes. little brother was there, and he like told me it was going to be a game changer. I put 100% of my entire life savings in one foreign ADR stock, Nintendo. And that stock, I remember that ticker well, because I was I was probably like 80% of my net worth was in that one yep. stock too. It like went up two and a half X in a year, yeah. you know, or something like that. It was crazy, 
crazy. And you remember, I was going to GameStop like every single day interviewing. They thought I was insane. Those people, they were like, <laughs> get the hell out of our store. I'm like, all right, just tell me, are you still selling out of all the Wii's? Is it going to stop? Like, is it going to, like, you seen demand taper off even a little bit? Like, they didn't know my whole life savings in this thing. And I only had one place to get information back then. It was before social media really was around, right? Like, so it's, that's how we did research. It was the only way to do it. Um, I mean, you you could have called, but you know, you had to pay by the minute to use a cell phone back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I was just doing some uh, just rough math. Um, so I have forty percent of my portfolio on Amazon, but eighty percent of my portfolio, if you include Amazon, Tesla, Apple, and GAN, that's like more than seventy five percent of my portfolio. In four. Yeah, Gans a little hot. Gans not doing well this week. I mean, that whole DraftKings deal with Michael Jordan. Oh. Uh, you know, like Michael Jordan, by the way, is awesome. It's an awesome person to get, and that that hurts Penn and competitors, including you know, including Gan. So, and the, the you know all the casinos that Gan rep. So I get it. I get that was a big negative for Gan and, and Penn this week. All right, so um, we'll, we'll open so this up for it, questions. If you guys have questions about uh, what we've done, but we we are you know past our one hour mark today, and. Uh, we like we like. Are we to... still doing the video premiere? Or no, Dave. Or do we have let it? Me, or no? Let me check. If if we do, it's really worth watching. So hang on. Let me just log into uh, our back end account. Guys, if we don't have this premiere ready, uh, it will be likely be ready at some point today on our old Dumb Money channel, which is just YouTube.com forward slash Dumb Money. And if you haven't been on that channel, it's where we put all of our shorter, super cool, edited. Uh, Clips could be seven, eight, nine minutes. Super fun to watch. We spent a lot of time and effort uh, editing those, and we really appreciate you guys watching those and giving them thumbs up. Looks like it's not uh, quite done uh, yet, but that the plan is okay. to have that on later today. So you should definitely go to our other channel, subscribe there, turn on that bell so that you get notified when we post new videos there. If you haven't done that here, do that here. Like buttons. Do Dave, we had to talk about SPH, propane. Can we talk about propane for a minute? Yes. Because everyone wants to know about it. I don't know if you guys have been in Discord. It's like one of the high conviction trades that a bunch of our community is vetting and talking about. Um, I did a bunch of research. I'm not done yet. Uh, SPH is a company that basically sells retail propane all around the country with a focus on the Northeast, okay? And the, the thesis that came up in our Discord group Guys, I don't know who in our Discord group came up with that. If you guys know, could you let us know so I can give, give the person some credit? Uh, the thesis is that, one, with a lot of the disaster stuff that's happened this summer with, you know, you have the blackouts in California, people are using their generators, you have the hurricane in, in Louisiana, lots of generators going on down there. You have the inland hurricane in Iowa, massive power outages, tons of generator use, and you also have uh, Tropical Storm Isaiah that hit the Northeast uh, that put out power in some places for over a week. So lots of power generation up there that's based on propane. So the thesis is that there will be an uptick in propane usage this quarter that would benefit SPH, which is a company that quite honestly has been in the dumps, uh, hasn't recovered at all, um, with all the restaurants basically going out of business or closing for a while, they don't certainly there's a there's a scare that they're not going to need any propane. But I think what's interesting is those restaurants that are opening or that have stayed open are likely to maybe use a lot more propane in the fall and winter, which are the two quarters that SPH generates the vast majority of its revenue. Because Dave, like people want to sit outside, right? They don't want to sit inside, they're scared, but they still want to go to restaurants. So at my restaurant, we're planning on having our, pro we're planning on maybe ordering even more propane-based heaters outside mm -hmm. and having those things operating, quite honestly, they'll probably operate two times as much as they do during a normal winter if the weather gets cold like normal. Uh, so it is kind of weather related, yeah. but there is a thesis for this company that is potentially really strong. And it's a, it, it does have all the makings of a really nice social arb trade, but it is a quirky company. Some people say it's mismanaged. It's been in the dumps. The propane sector in general is kind of in the dumps the last few years. And there's another propane company competitor that essentially went out of business. Their stock went from like 30 or 40 to zero almost. I need, I need um, to do more so, research on that one. Yeah, Isn't the price I mean, listen, of propane up though? Um, 
So, or I know nat gas is, but I don't know about the propane. price of propane, Jordan, I think yeah. is actually down, I believe, okay. because people were saying that they should be able to buy their propane cheaper, but they're not really selling it cheaper. So the word yeah, is kind of a of fixed, they have a fixed sales price on the, yeah, you know, the, the because here's whatever. the thing, Jordan, like, like the propane market, it's all about distribution, right? So it's not like, it's not like you can, there's like five different propane brands when you go to buy propane propane at the grocery. So if SPH has deals with 5,000 groceries and people like that that sell the propane, like they kind of could do whatever they want in terms of pricing because there's not that much elasticity when it comes to demand. People want their propane and either they're not going to shop you that much, right? Um, so Yeah, and some I people don't, don't uh, didn't it run some people's houses too? Like if you live out, you know. People have yes. like huge, uh, huge deals of propane, like in their backyard. Like if you live out in the country. Yeah. So I listen. I haven't finished my research on this stock, but I will say this: if you guys are wanting to really dig in to like a really meaty social arb trade, this is a good social arb trade to research, right? So I would say get in our Discord channel. There's actually something called High Conviction Trade Ideas. That's one of our channels in Discord, and I think. I think that's where most of the conversation has been happening around SPH. So, um, you know, get in there and debate it. Like, like I'm not, understand something. I am not like the end all person on this is a good trade or this is a bad trade. What I am is doing this for a decade and a half or more that I, I'm, I'm going to contribute just like anyone else. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to surface things that our group might not be thinking of. Uh, I'm going to help with the research, and I hope I can contribute on this one. But it's not me being the end-all decider whether this is a good trade or not. I'm researching it. I'm just like you guys. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm reading everything I can about this company. I would love for you guys to start making some phone calls, if you can, to some propane dealers and asking them, hey, is demand to the same way we've been doing this with Peloton all summer long. Let's do it with this company, right? I mean, it's the same process over and over and over just different companies. So you guys are getting the process down now. Let's go through the process. Let's share the intelligence. And everybody can make their own decisions at the end of the day, uh, whether it's a good or bad trade. Oh, there's an SPH channel. Thank you, guys. So if you go to Discord, there's actually a channel for SPH when you can really dig in. I haven't made my decision, guys. I don't know if I like this one or yet. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. I haven't, I haven't done the research yet either. So that's definitely something that I need to look at. Yeah, I, it's a it's a fun one. So, I mean, who else? Wall Street's not thinking about pro, retail propane, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> so like neither are like Robin Hooders, you know. Like, and that's what I like about it. I don't know that it's you know that widely covered or thought about. And th those are always those are always good if you can find something kind of like HP. Like no one really cared about trying to social arb a, the printer trade, right? Besides us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. But uh. All right, man. Uh, that 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 that's it, dude. I, I'm 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 done. I think. Listen, Dave. I feel like we have we've covered like one and a half percent of our history in this episode, <laughs> and that's what this episode is going to be about. But like, if we cover more of it, I will be. If I, I'm gonna, I can start bringing stuff up from our past. We didn't even talk about our companies, e list, right? Ticker tags um, that we started and sold. We're gonna have to have more episodes on this guy. So if you like this episode, give us a thumbs up and let us know. Like, do you want to us, do you like us sharing like when we were prior yeah. to having all this money, how we got there? Like, is that interesting? And if you guys, if you're still watching, we're, we'll, we'll end this and then we'll have the replay. Go in the comment section and let us know in that kind of permanent comment that you either like this, that you want to hear more about which company you want to hear more about, whether it's eCarList, which was our software company that Lynn and Jordan founded and Chris and I came aboard later or ticker tags that they founded and that I briefly uh, came and worked there before you sold it. And then- um, Wiki tags. Yes, that was going to be the big uh, yeah. thing. Yeah, Wiki tags. That was going to be the next big thing. Um, <laughs> um, like, l let us Dave, know what you're interested we, in start down, down in the uh, comments. Should we, should, we, should we do like the, on Twitter, we're talking, thinking about guys, we want to get more active on Twitter. That's like a commitment we're making to the community. Cause I, it's so easy for me to pop on Twitter. Maybe us doing some ask us anything's on Twitter a few times yeah. a week. 
just separately, like Dave will do it, Jordan will do it. Maybe we all commit to doing at least one or two a week. Would you guys like that? When I'm just, I'll just pop on Twitter, do it, ask me anything. I'll try to do it at a designated time, so you know I'm going to be on there. Maybe like after the show or something yeah, like we that. We should definitely do that. Uh, and I, I, I have bad today. news that for some reason the live stream did not go out to Twitter today, even though I have it going to restream and everything looks like it's set up and we actually are on Facebook Live, but. For some reason, it did not make it over to Twitter, and I can't figure it out. We could maybe like replay it right now on Twitter. We can figure it out. That would be cool. Um, I might. But yeah, guys, so we're, we're gonna let us know how you want to interact with us. If Twitter's a good place, by the way, get that Peloton, man. What do you have to lose? Get on Twitter and retweet the Dumb Money TV Peloton tweet. Do not forget to do that because then you're automatically, you know, basically telling us you want the Peloton. And you'll be in the mix for when, hopefully, if Peloton goes up at least a penny next week on earnings, uh, you'll be in the mix to get one. Uh, Dumbmoney. That's it. Or, or Twitter.com slash TV is where you get that official tweet. And you have to retweet the one in the official tweet to uh, be officially entered. Which It's pinned to the top yeah. of our page, so uh, you should be able to find that without a problem. And but guys, follow us separately on Twitter if you want to just have direct conversations with any of us. Uh, at Chris Camillo, right? At Jordan McLean, is that right, Jordan? At Dave Hansen? Underscore. There's Jordan, an underscore, underscore in there somewhere. They're on the screen here. Yeah. Dave Hansen, Chris okay. Camillo, Jordan right, cool. underscore McLean. Underscore is your middle yeah, name, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on, I'm it, on there like, forward slash. <laughs> no underscore for me. I'm on there like three, four, five, six, seven, eight times a day. So uh, feel free to tweet at me and. Uh, let me know what you're thinking, and guys. Follow, uh, follow podcast, us there right, in all the places. Is, Make sure you do also follow us on Instagram. We post there from time to time. Listen to our podcast. If you happen to be on the go and can't watch our live episodes, we put them on all of the major podcasting platforms just for you. And uh, what else? I, I think that's it. Where else are we? Yeah. yeah. I, I should you really make a list of all the places. Oh, actually, Monday is a holiday, so I think we're going to be on on Tuesday, right? Tuesday. So. Okay. We'll 